All right. So this morning we're uh, continuing on our, our series called uh, Reset. Uh, this is, you know, it's the around the first of the year. We're in, we're in January, so so it's a good time to stop uh, and, and look at our lives and see, you know, where we need uh, to hit that reset button to, to kind of start over, kind of, kind of go back uh, and, and and get a clean slate to get a fresh start um, on stuff. Uh, last week we looked at, at resetting into God's church and resetting and, and coming into the assembly of. God um, and, and knowing that we had to be together and to be unified and to actually physically be here together as a family um, so that we can grow. Um, but, but the faith journey that we live, um, this, this life of faith, this Christian uh, life that we have is, is more than just this hour. It's more than just this service. It's more than just this building. And it's really just more than just this people um, that, that we are surrounded by. Um, if all of the learning that you ever do uh, takes place in these pews, there's a problem. If, if the only spiritual growth that you ever get come while you're sitting in these pews, uh, there's, there's a problem. If, if the only uh, teaching or, or instruction or anything that you get is from me in this 30 minutes that I get to preach to you, if that's all you get, that's not enough. That is woefully short and it's not even close. If, if the only growth that you have is right here, right now, it's not enough. Uh, we can't just come to this place once a week for one hour and just call it good. We need to be doing everything that we can, drawing ourselves close to the heart of God every single day, many, many times throughout the day. Last week, we talked about resetting to God's church. This morning, we were talking about resetting uh, to God's heart. You know, it's not too common uh, for us to see that, that as time goes on, uh, we fade away. And, and we see it in everything. We fade away, uh, you know, from, from our spouses. We fade away, uh, you know, from, from our jobs. You know, you get a new job and you're super excited about that and you're willing to do anything for it. But as time goes on, you kind of fade away and it's just not as exciting anymore. You go out and you get married and you love your spouse. Your spouse is great and then you live together and then uh, you kind of fade away a little bit. And you have to fight to stay close. It's the same thing when it comes to the heart of God. It is so easy to just uh, fade away and just slip away from the heart of God. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, we just go through the motions. Uh, sometimes we just, we do the things that we think we need to do. And just so, just because we think we're supposed to do it. You know, we come to church once a week just because we think that's what we're supposed to do or we have someone in our life that makes us do it or, you know, they don't want someone bothering them or calling them if they don't come to church. But we don't walk with God and we don't work diligently to stay close to his heart. We don't do anything on our own. And as a result, we fall away. We move away from the heart of God and we fade away from what he wants for us. You know, most of the time when this happens, it's not something um, that happens intentionally. You know, it's not like you wake up one day and say, you know what, today I feel like just straying away from God. You know, you don't wake up one day and be like, you know what, I'm walking too closely with God. I think I'm going to kind of push myself away a little bit. It's not something that, that, that happens intentionally. It's not something that, that we do on purpose. It's something that just happens on its own over time. We fade away. Uh, we fade away slowly a little at a time and we move away from the heart of God and we drift and further and further away until we look up and we see that there's this vast distance between us. But the question is why, um, or more importantly, the question is what causes that movement away from God? Why do we move away from God? Why do we push away from the heart of God? Why do we come to a point in our life where we stop actively pursuing and chasing after and going after the heart of God? We fall away from the heart of God because we stop chasing after him. We fall away because we stop reading the word and studying it. We fall away because we don't spend time in prayer and direct communication with God. We fall away from the heart of God because we stop praising and worshiping him throughout our entire lives. These attitudes and these three blessings God has given us so that we can draw near to the heart of God. God has given these blessings to us so that we can come and draw near to him and stay close to him so that as we walk through this life, he is right there with us. When we stay close to the heart of God, uh, we stay close to that purpose that he has for us. But when we fall away from the heart of God, we fall away from what he wants for us. When we fall away from the heart of God, we fall away uh, from the righteousness that he has for us. 
And when we fall away from the heart of God, we fall away from living within his purpose and his will. Because in order to live this life the way that God has called us to, the way that the Bible has called us to, we have to actively stay as close to God's heart as possible. It's just like this. This is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a target. Okay? And then I've got, I've got some bow and arrows here. Don't worry, they're nerf. Don't worry. I, I thought about bringing an actual bow and arrow, but I thought that would probably be dangerous. But, but if I'm standing right on top of this target, what is the chance of me hitting this target? If I can get it loaded in there. What's the chance of me hitting this target? It's pretty, it's pretty good. If I'm right here, what's the chance of me hitting the target? It's pretty good. I'm going to hit the bullseye every single time. But what happens as I take a step away? What are my chances of hitting the target now? They've gotten, they've gotten a little slim. I'm still, I'm still trying. I'm in pretty good shape here. Watch your face. Sorry about that. <laughs> Y'all are in the splash zone. It's like SeaWorld. You better, better, yeah. But see, what happens the further and further I get, what happens? Uh-oh. <laughs> don't worry. I move the glass trees. I move the glass trees. Don't worry. So what happens the further and further away I get? Okay. I might get lucky, you know, every now and then and hit a target. But what happens the further and further? The further, the further away I get from that, leaving it by Any chance at all? You think so? Oh, man. That's not good at all. But what happens when I get almost so far away from the target? Come on, I'm watch out for her. What happens when I get just so far away? I can barely even see it. Listen, I'm not mad. That's awesome stuff. Dude, that's what everybody got there. Hey, what's up? But see, the same exact thing that happens in our spiritual life. There's no way to stop that. How crazy is that? I'm actually probably better for the spirit. Anyway, but it's the exact same thing that happens in our spiritual lives. When we come to a point where we fall away from God and we fade away from God and we get so far away from Him, there's no way we can hit the target. There's no way that we can live a life that he has called us to. There's no way to live a righteous life, an unright life, a holy life, a life that he has called us to that brings him glory and honor. It's the same exact thing as standing this far away from the target. Yeah, I might get lucky every now and then and, and hit one, but, but the chances are, are, are more uh, slim the further away I get. But if I come to a point in my life where I repent, and I come back and I get closer. I got, I got a better chance. I can get closer and closer and closer to the target. The closer I get. So now, now that I'm now that I'm getting closer and coming back to the heart of God, I can start hitting that target again. Is that so? So what we see is that the closer we are to God, the better we are when we come to living a life of righteousness. You know, last week we talked about uh, resetting to the church. Uh, we talked about resetting to the early church and, and, and living our lives and living our lives as, as a church body like the early church. But there, there are three beautiful things uh, that are in a passage that we read last week that I want to pull out for you. This is from Acts 2, 42 through 47. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers and all came upon every soul and wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as had any need. And day by day, they attended the temple together and breaking the bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. This is a photo of the early church. This is a glimpse inside that early church. And, this, and it's a beautiful passage because we can see what our churches today should still look like. Uh, last week, we talked about the unity, how they were together, how they were always eating together and, and, and they were unified and they were all in for the same common goal. They were close to the heart of God. And as a result, the kingdom grew and grew and grew. But if we look at it a little bit deeper, we can see uh, the three things that they were in, the three things that they were um, uh, 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 growing through. It says they were devoted to the teachings of the apostles. The teachings of the apostles are literally our New Testament. 
So they were devoted to the New Testament. It says they were devoted um, to the prayers and they praised God uh, together. This is how the early church was made up. This is how the early church held fast to the heart of God. And as a result, it grew and grew and grew. So when we say we need to come to a place where we have to reset to the heart of God, we have to start in these three areas. The word of God, prayer and worship. Those three areas of those three uh, disciplines in our lives, they have to be uh, there and present every single moment of every single day. Listen, the Bible is the greatest blessing that we have in our life. Now that may sound crazy when you think about all the blessings that we have in our lives, even, and, and even all the things, the blessings that we have when it comes to us and God, the Bible is the greatest blessing. I believe that. And that may sound crazy because we've taken it for granted for so long. We've all had access to the Bible our entire lives. We've never had to try to get our hands on a copy of the Bible. We have countless copies at our disposal. I have 12 Bibles on my desk in my office, and that doesn't count the one that's on my computer that I use to prepare sermons with. I mean, we all have access to it, yet we hardly ever use it. We know that what's in this book is the Word of God. We believe that. It's one of our, our core beliefs and our core values. Yet so many times we see it sitting on a nightstand or, or sitting on the kitchen table or sitting on the counter or sitting up on a bookshelf covered in dust. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you opened your Bible? This is a good time to stop and be honest with yourself. And some of you, look, it was this morning and you had a devotion. Everything was great. Good for you. Carry that on. Keep that up. But for some of you, it's been a long time. What we have in this book is all of the instructions that we need from God. <laughs> and then we ignore it and we wonder why everything's going wrong. What we have in this Bible is all of the encouragement of God for his people. Yet we never open it. We wonder why we struggle to get through the day. We have the word of God. We have the word of God in here uh, telling us what is right and what is wrong. Yet we never, ever open it. How can you grow in the knowledge of the book if you don't open it? How will you know what is the will of God for your life if you don't read the word? How are you going to know what is sin and what is not sin if you don't read the word? If the only scripture you ever read is the scriptures on this screen, then you are missing out. There's got to be more than that. We have the word of God at our fingertips. And if you don't want to read an actual paper, you can read it on your phone. It's the greatest blessing that we have and we need to use it. Look what Paul told the church in Rome, Romans 15. He says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ, that together you may come with one voice and glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says the Bible is here for our instruction and for our encouragement so that we can have endurance in this life, so that we can have hope so that we can have harmony with one another, so that we can in one voice give glory to God. How are we going to do that if we never read the words that were written in the former days? How can we live a life without the instruction, without the encouragement, without the endurance, without the hope that we get from Scripture? The Bible's written, and it's there for us, uh, to be complete, to help us, to build us up. Look at Hebrews 4. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from its sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must give an account. You see, the Bible, that's kind, of a, that's kind of a scary passage. The Bible is there to literally break us apart. It is literally to cut us down to the bone. It is there to tear us apart limb from limb, in a figuratively speaking. 
He's there to break us down and convict us and to show us where we are wrong in our life, to show us the sin that's in our hearts. How in the world can we be torn apart by the Bible if we never look at it? We've got to be in the Word all the time. The Old Testament was no different. Look what Joshua told the people uh, about the Word of God in, in 1 verse 8. It says, the book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you all should meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful in a, to do in accordance all that is written. For then you will be made prosperous, and then you will have good success. Well, that's still pretty good advice right here. He says, look, this word of law should never depart from your mouth. He's like, you should be in the word of God all the time. You should always be talking about it. It should be one of the central foundations of your life. It's a great plan to stay close to the heart of God. And I love how the psalmist puts it in Psalm 119. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. He says, the word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's such a, that's such a great image right there. If you've ever been walking somewhere where it's dark, you know, especially if you're walking through your kid's room and at night, you know, you're like, you turn off their lamp, you got to get back to the door and there's like mountains of toys and you got to like dodge all the Legos or your feet are going to pay for it. You want a light to see where you're going. And the psalmist says that the Bible, the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path to get us through this life. We cannot ignore this book. It is the instruction manual, the encouraging truth and the source of all hope for all humanity. The Bible is there to draw us close to the heart of God. We also need prayer in our lives. Prayer is a, is a communication with the creator of the universe. I want you to think about that for just a second. We have the opportunity in the means, and not only are we allowed to do it, we're, we're commanded to do it, and we are encouraged to do it, to talk to God. To spend time with God. The one who created the universe and everything in it just by speaking the word. Uh, the one who has sustained his people throughout the generations. The one who loves us enough to send his son to come to this earth, to die on the cross, to defeat death once and for all. The God who has set up heaven throughout all of eternity so that we can live and be with him. That God wants to spend time with you. You have access to to that God that you can stop at any moment of any day and stop and talk to him. Yet we rarely use it. Think about what, if, what would happen if you had the phone number to the White House and the President of the United States, whoever it is, uh, you know, you pick your president, your favorite president of all time. Uh, this isn't a political thing. This is just a, uh, you'll understand. So, so you have the phone number to the White House and the president says, call me anytime. I want you to call me. Please call me. Don't you think you would use that phone number? Don't you think that you would call the White House and talk to the President of the United States? If you had the phone number from the most powerful person on the entire planet, wouldn't you call him? Think about it. If you had to pick your favorite celebrity, your favorite celebrity out there, uh, and you had their phone number, and they said, text me anytime. I want to hear from you. Please text me so that we can talk and we can hang out. Wouldn't you text? You would blow that number up. You would wear that phone number out. Yet we have a direct line of communication with the creator of the universe, and we don't use it. And we don't use it. We leave God sitting on red. We don't communicate. We don't talk. We just ignore that. We just ignore him, and it, and it shouldn't be that way. How can we stay close to the heart of God if we're not talking to him? How can we stay close to the heart of God if we're not sitting in his presence doing all we can to hear from him? How can we stay close to the heart of God if we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and speak to us? God wants us to pray. God wants us uh, to be in his presence. God wants to lead and direct us. God wants to help us through this life. In the book of James, we see a great directive of prayer, a great picture of why and when we should pray. This is from James 5. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over them, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Notice what James said. He's like, look, if you're sick, you need to pray. If you're happy, you need to pray. If you're sad, you need to pray. If you're going through something, you need to pray. If you've got sin in your heart, you need to pray. No matter what the situation of life, no matter what the scenario that we could be going through, he's like, you need to pray. You need to take it to God. Whatever situation would arise, you need to pray. Listen, prayer should be the default reaction to every single situation that we find ourselves in, be it good or bad. Just look at a few of the Psalms. It's from Psalm 17. It says, I will call upon the Lord. You will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Because when we call on God, he will answer. We will be heard. What about Psalm 145? It says, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. I mean, how great of a passage is that? He says, look, if you call on God, God will come near to you. It's not some big cosmic, uh, you know, switch uh, board where we, you know, send our call in. It's got to make all these transitions. We pray and God is there drawing near to us. More from the Psalms. It says, for the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayers. God does not despise the prayer of the destitute. Even though the God is so glorious. And God is so awesome that there's no reason we should ever be able to come into his presence. God still welcomes our prayers. One more from the book of Psalm from 141. It says, oh, Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as an incense before you and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. It says our prayers are a fragrant offering to God. Our prayers are like incense before him. Not only are we allowed to pray, not only do we have this, not only, you know, can we go to God if something's going on, not only can we go to God, whether it be happy or sad, it says God enjoys it. It is like a fragrant offering being being given to him. It brings him pleasure and joy when we pray. And one final call from Paul to the church in Rome. He says, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. Be constant in prayer. Listen, it is impossible to stay close to the heart of God if we're not in prayer. And not only every single day, but many, many, many times through the day. Several times in his writing, Paul says, be in prayer constantly. He says, constantly be in prayer. Now, that's not saying to be on our hands and knees every single day or or constantly 24 hours a day, but that we should be constant in prayer, living a life that is is, um, welcoming God in our midst. And that takes us straight into praise and worship. Look, this is just a different type of praying if we're being honest. This is just a prayer in giving thanksgiving and honor and glory and giving it back to God. Praise and worship, but it's, it's more than just singing songs. You know, the worship that's in our life has got to be more than just four songs that opens up a service and one song that closes it. It's got to be more than that. The way that we live our lives is, is worship to God. You know, if we live our lives and we bring him glory and honor, that is worship to him. If we go to our our jobs, we go to our workplace and and, and we are are selfless and we help people and and we're honest and true in everything we do, that brings glory and honor to him. And that is a form of worship. The way that we uh, treat our spouse is a form of worship. The way that we raise our kids is a form of worship. We praise God through it all. Because let's be honest, God is worthy of our praise. God is worthy of our admiration. God is worthy of any and all worship that we could throw at him. And in heaven, all we will do is worship him because in heaven, that's all that goes on is worship. Look what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13. He says, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek that city that is to come. So through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Look, we will worship 
and praise God throughout all of eternity. So we might as well start now. And when we worship God and we live a life of worship, this brings us and draws us close to the heart of God. You know, when we read that passage from the early church, we see, we see them praising God together. We see worship in there. And then we see when Paul's talking to the church of Colossae in chapter 3. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. So Paul is instructing the church here on how to stay close to the Father. He's instructing them how to hit the target every day. He says, come together and praise and worship and sing songs and psalms to God. Worship along with Bible study and prayer is the foundation of staying close to the heart of God. One more from the book of Hebrews uh, from chapter 12. It says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. We have a kingdom that we are receiving that cannot and will not ever be shaken. And because of that, we have thanksgiving and gratitude and praise and worship to God. Listen, church, as a body of believers and as individual followers of Christ, it is crucial. It is crucial for us to stay close to the heart of God. We cannot go through this life and not be close to the heart of God. We cannot go through this life and not be right there with God, walking with him step by step. Because if we're not close to the heart of God, everything else is going to suffer. If we go through this life and we fall away from God, our marriage is going to suffer. If we go through this life and we fall away from God, the way that we raise our kids is going to suffer. If we go through this life and we fall away from the heart of God, uh, then the way that we work in our job is going to suffer. Everything suffers when we're not there by the heart of God. We cannot go through this life and be far from God. We cannot go through this life and expect to live a life worthy of Him if we're not right there close with Him. We cannot fall away and falter and wander away from the King of Kings and expect to stay right there where we need to be. We need to make sure that we are close to God and close to His heart every single day. We need to make sure that, that we're making a point and a desire to chase after the heart of God. We need to be seeking him with everything that we have. We need to be making a conscious effort and an intentional action to go after the heart of God and to be near to him. We can't just hope that it happens. We can't just come here and not put anything into this and hope that we draw near to God. <clears throat> You know, in life, you get out of it what you put into it. And it's the same with our spiritual lives and even exponentially even more. We need to be coming to God and chasing after God and getting to close to him, as close to him as possible. One more passage from the book of James. He says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How great of a passage is that? He says, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. But if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. How awesome of a passage, how awesome of a truth is that? And when we come to a place of temptation, we can just resist the devil and he's going to run away. But if we just look at God and say, hey, we want to come close to you, God. And he says, I am right here. I'm right here. Draw near to God. and He will draw near to you. And it's just like when we're shooting arrows at a target. The closer we are to the target, the better we're going to be. 
The closer we are to the target, the better chance we have of hitting the bullseye exactly where we need to be. But the further and further we get away, the harder and harder it is to hit the target. The closer we are to the heart of God, the better chance we have of living a life for Him. So we need to reset and come back to the target. We need to reset and come back to a God that wants what's best for us. We need to reset and come closer and closer and closer to the heart of God. We need to reset and come as close to the heart of God as we possibly can so that there is no way that we can miss the bullseye. We need to reset and become so close to God that it is difficult to tell where God ends and where we begin. We need to be so close to the heart of God that his purpose and his point and his will for our life um, is, matches ours so much, uh, or ours matches his really, uh, that they are intertwined together and you can't tell the two apart. We need to reset ourselves and get so close to the heart of God that we will do anything and everything to further the kingdom of God here on this earth. That's what this life should look like. That's what the life, this life of faith should look like. That each and every one of us should look like. We need to rededicate ourselves to chasing after the heart of God. We need to recommit to get as close to God as possible. We all need to reset to the heart of God today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we are so thankful uh, that we have the opportunity to come close to you. We are so thankful that we have the opportunity um, to, to live a life worthy of you. God, please forgive us for the times when we have fallen away from you, where we've pushed ourselves away from you. Forgive us of that and break us of that. We pray that you will awaken in us a fire to come and, and, and chase after you and seek your heart and draw close to you so that we can live a life that is worthy of you. God, we love you, and we are yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we need you every hour. Be with us as we leave this place. Let us draw close to you so that as we leave this place, people can see you. God, let us be a light into the world. We love you, we're yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.